Now then, listener, I want to let you know that my book, What a Flanker, is available now in paperback. It's had some great feedback. Rugby World said, what a flanker, what a book. The Telegraph described it as explosive. The Sun said, not for the faint of heart. If you haven't got a copy now, order yours in paperback. Or get it in ebook or audiobook read by me. Thanks for your support. Now on with the show. Hi everyone, I'm Jace Haskell and you're listening to What A Flanker Series 2, the podcast. I'm joined today by UK techno legend, British producer, known for his commanding style of big room techno. It's Alan Fitzpatrick. How are you, sir? I'm good, mate. How are you? Do you know what? I'm all right. I'm yeah. all right. You, I'm your, I can sense your excitement just to be out of the house today. Yeah, it's been nice. Even just travelling up here, I'm like, yes, doing something. It's like, you know, not just sitting in the garden or walking around the house, so it's good. Found a reason to get out and come down to the bright the bright lights of London from, exactly. from, from Southampton, where, you, you're, where you're based. Yeah. How's lockdown been for you? Big question. Big question. Let's Big start question in. Let's start seriously. One. Gone straight in yeah. with it. Um, mental, if I'm quite honest. I think we've been right through the sort of range of emotions since it's all started. Um, but I don't. It's hard to sum it up in a, in a question. But I just think it's like when you you know you're in a relationship or, or something else. You go through these stages, don't you? Of sort of feelings. I think at the start of everything, I was very angry of everything sort of felt like someone had pulled the rug from under your feet on your career and stuff like that and just everything had stopped and there was no sort of news on what was happening you know but then you know as sort of time goes on you start to reflect on things and it, it got a little bit easier but it's definitely a sort of a strange time I mean I've been quite vocal as well with sort of going up and down through the sort of emotions of it all and stuff but yeah, it's been a strange one, but I think some good stuff has come out of it. I mean, I was probably touring more heavily than I needed to be, less creative, um, you know, on the on the road a lot. So I'm probably I'm making more music and probably better music now than I've ever made because I've been locked in a studio for 12 months. So that's been pretty cool. But um, I've learned to bake. <laughs> I can. I can Every do fuck has learned to bake oh, during I can this do thing. A decent loaf. Amazing. Um, yeah, so that's been pretty cool. Spending time with the kids, you know. Not that you don't have a great bond with your kids. Obviously, you do. But, I mean, it, our unit now is completely solidified due to the fact that we've been in each other's pockets for sort of 12 months, which has been amazing. Um, certain things as well, like, I don't know, uh, Halloween and Easter and... Uh, all these sorts of dates where I'm normally touring, I've got to spend with the kids, which has been quite mental. New Year's Eve being an insane one. I've not been in the house on New Year's Eve for the last pff, 15 years. So getting to sort of do those sort of moments with them has been pretty nice. Um, but, you know, I would have loved to have been playing, obviously. But, you know, it's been, there's been some good moments. I mean, the reason I wanted to, the reason I wanted to talk to you is uh, I've been a fan of yours for about for a while um, and I, I kind of were going to you know dot around a little bit because I want to talk more about kind of the the mental health stuff um, in relation to this period later on but, yeah. it, but I was fascinated with watching you on social media how kind of honest you've been um, you know we became quite friendly um, on kind of WhatsApp as people do on social media of course. Um, because I featured a couple of your um, tracks in my, my radio show Back Row Radio and I kind of I'd always, I was late to kind of techno and actually it's become like a real passion of mine, but unfortunately I'm not cool enough to ever play it <laughs> or get involved in it. Cause, cause I'm right. So techno is quite a tight, tight club, isn't it? Well, yeah. The purist would say, would say so. I think, yeah. Um, the, the sort of moody side of music, I suppose. But again, I think that's a stigma that people put to it. But, well, I'm just know. worried that I, cause I, 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 when I first started getting into DJing and my musical music sort of taste changed and I was getting into much more kind of techno and actually I like your brand of techno even though some of it's quite hardcore the the, the vocal elements the rave elements of it yeah. I really enjoy that you know stuff that's just that has that goes nowhere that has nothing yes there's a time and place for it if it's you know seven in the morning you're out your tree I can understand that of course but you know I like those the combination of elements the rave elements the hands in the air the way tracks the tracks progress um yeah. and I really wanted to sort of follow your your sort your journey because you know you had an you have an amazing career you're just sort of top of your top of your game um where did it all start like what when did you always want to be a dj um from a very early age yeah certainly i mean my sort of beginnings into dance music probably started from um i guess from middle school on i going into secondary school i mean i was one of those kids that 
was kind of recording stuff off the radio and trying to hit pause before the DJ spoke, you know, whether it be getting chart music or whatever and making mixtapes and stuff like that when you're a kid. Um, and then that sort of progressed into going into secondary school, obviously meeting a load of other new people that you do when schools come together for secondary school, and then getting into sort of listen to tape packs and like you know rave music when you used to be able to buy the sort of t packs and stick it on your Walkman and listen to it at school. And then from that, I guess uh, when I was old enough, sort of 15 years old, started going to the Opera House in Bournemouth at a night called Slinky, um, and that was kind of. I guess the South Coast version of like a gate crasher or God's Kitchen, that that kind of thing, really. And then we were going and seeing all sorts of DJs ranging from all sorts of styles. So that's where it sort of. But were your parents into music? Like, where where did it come from? Because I I remember my my kind of musical journey. The first CD I ever bought was Brimful of Asher on the forty five. That was and I was like when I was fourteen. Yeah. I, like my mum. I think mine was a wrestling. Uh, I think it was like um, British Bulldogs, uh, WWE. Oh really? Rap or something shit like that. <laughs> or the Bartman or something awful. Right. You know, okay. But, yeah. And well, I because I, my mum was really into music, so we were in the car. You know, Tina Turner, Michael Jackson. Yeah. I was into that kind of stuff, but it, it didn't. It didn't affect me. Like I was now that I'm so into it, right. it's happened much more later in life. And what you're saying, it was like massive for, for you. But what? But why? I just, I just think music is. is it certainly with my family as well. If, if we're going to go back to sort of roots, my mum and dad are massively into northern soul music. They still go to northern soul, well, what you would class as a rave, I guess, up to Blackpool and wherever else. And they listen to northern soul a lot. So, and they were always listening to music. You know, if I'm, when you're younger, if your mum's hoovering or whatever, there's music on it, all the '80s stuff, all the people you mentioned, and, and more. So it's been instilled in me to sort of listen to music. You know, I've had an older sister and lots of people playing music around me, which I guess is just kind of rooted in me now. But, um, yeah, certainly from a very young age, young, as, as far back as I can remember, I've always been, you know, involved in some sort of dance music element. But um, the 80s has been was massive for me, watching Top of the Pops and, and the early 90s as well, because that was probably when I was, uh, yeah, 12, 13 years old. You sort of coming in to see, like... Prodigy and stuff like that on top of the pops, you know, and Chemical Brothers and all that sort of early stuff. I guess it's just sort of gone from there and spiralled out from there, really. Because I read on your bio, it said that your I was right to so your dad was into sort of Motown. You grew up on like a bit of diet, soul and funk, so you had like a really eclectic taste to start with. Yeah, exactly. And from an early age, I was um, given my uncle and my dad's record collection. So I had like disco records and stuff like that from quite an early age, you know. So I was sort of, you know, listening to them, playing around with them and stuff. And I think when I was 13 or 14 was when I first got some turntables, I mean, shit ones, but enough that I could just play through all this music. So I've just I've always had a record collection, which has spanned all over the place from an early age. Do you still have that now? Still have it now, yeah. A bit dusty and probably a bit mouldy now, but it's still in my record box. You know, still, I mean, in my sort of stacks, I've still got it all. Um, I, what I should do, what I haven't done in, during this lockdown period is what, what you know, what I should, maybe had a bit more time than I thought I could have done is gone through it all and maybe categorised it all. So maybe that's something for me to do. So. Something to do, mate. We're looking for always yeah. things to do during oh, this mate, lockdown 100%, period. Otherwise, I'll bake another fucking load. <laughs> So. Mate, yeah, that's no good. Because obviously your musical tastes now are quite specific. Do you know what I mean? When did you... Because there's two things I want to ask you. When did you go into that more dancey stuff? So you said like the Prodigy and kind of Chemical Brothers and that stuff, and that was kind of almost mainstream, yeah. ravey kind of vibe. Did you... Was it you were going to like... Um, uh, rave events and stuff like that and it was that was the party scene that you had and you went more towards that or how did that come about was it like somebody who got you got you into it some group that just inspired you yeah i mean initially when when i was first buying records and it was all part of it was all around about the same time when we were going club into um slinky in the opera house in bournemouth or boscombe where it was the the mix of DJs you could see there was all over the place different to now festivals that happens but mainly now sort of club nights are branded or it's a style of music that, that sort of runs through those DJs. When you can kind of go to an event when I was younger and it was kind of all sorts of different music, there was a drum and bass room and then there was a trance DJ on after a house DJ and yeah. stuff like this, you were generally exposed to loads of different music. So from that, I was buying all sorts of different music and then uh, I'd just go to HMV and buy like the sort of free for a tenner type things but then that progressed into uh, going to movement records in um in Southampton which was a lot more I guess in depth you could find underground stuff and then you start digging and then start to develop a bit more of a sort of following for 
you know, a particular style or something. So, so you, so you used to go to the event and they would have so many different varieties of music, but then you obviously, because a lot of people I talk to, especially DJ, something that I will never have had, A, because I was late to music and just the way that things are done now, I didn't have a, never had the record shop yeah. experience. Was that yeah. like a really important part of your of Absolutely your life? Absolutely key. Absolutely key. Yeah. I mean, I would just go to the record shop and they'd have like three or four listening stations of decks, and you you just sort of say a few names of people that you're into or sort of labels or whatever, and you get a stack of records. Staying there for six hours, listening to music, speaking to other people. It's the best way of like if you imagine now. People use Instagram and stuff to network and build up a kind of collective of in interests that are the same and maybe develop something, and that's where ideas are put together. If you're in a record shop and you've got 10 people in there and you one guy's maybe sort of started making some music or one guy's DJing at this pub or club or whatever, and you kind of just start to build up a little bit of a social crew within that setting, and then that can kind of lead to all sorts of different things. You know, I expect all the best ideas from... Yeah, music and clubs and the record labels and stuff like this started either at an after party when people were chatting about stuff or in a lot those of chatting sort of... goes a lot of chat oh, goes a lot, a lot of shit gets a lot chatting, of shit chat. yeah, a lot, lot of chew... absolute shit a lot, lot of chewing people's faces off with <laughs> yeah. like real deep and meaningful conversations yeah exactly but I also think those sort of environments whether it's in a record shop or whether it's on a sofa at an after party with people you don't really know too well that that's where these ideas seem to come out of let's do something let's do this or let's you know, maybe start playing some music together, and you know, it sort of builds into a thing. Did you Quite have a important. relationship with a guy, with the guys at the record shop, so they would get you early releases, white labels, and stuff that you? Yeah, hundred percent. You, I mean, lots of people will say that they have these connections, I suppose, in record shops. But you'd always, you know, sort of see grand shake stuff, and you might they, back in those days as well. It might be like, you know, obviously now you can go and download a track as many times as you want on Beatport or something. But then it might be like the shop's got three copies of this particular record and they'll hold them back to people that they want to give them to to listen. You know, So it's a bit like gold dust. They still call Vana now the black gold for that reason, I think. But I have it in terms of, you know, I listen to, um, you know, when I, when I train or when I uh, work, I'm always listening to music because I, I think... I don't know whether you agree with this, but I think there's also like too much music now and there's too much at your fingertips, whereas actually that staggered approach and that not knowing it and some people having it, it means that you're always constantly looking for for new for new music. And I hear these mixes and I'm like Shazam in it, going through, you know, go, I, pay, I go on Mixcloud Select, get the yeah, yeah. playlist, I'm p typing it in, trying to buy it, trying to find it. And you just can't find it anywhere. You're no. like, how? And you're trying to think to yourself, how can I can I can I, can I lift this off? Because I'd love to put it in my radio show. I want to just listen to it. And you can't. And you have to just wait. And you have to check in every month. I sort of have a little bit of what you what you had, but then equally, there's just so much other music that's at your fingertips that you you constantly think, is there something I'm missing out on? Is yeah, there more? Yeah, is FOMO. there more? Yeah. Well, I think now as well, like there is probably well, there's a hundred percent. We know. We all know there is. There's too much music. You know. But then that is there's a, there's pros and cons to that. The fact that there's so much music now is it's so easy to just start a record label and put the track out. So you 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 have to have this kind of internal filter on what's good and what's not. Do you know what I mean? But um, yeah, I mean you'll never sort of get rid of that crate digging sort of theory of trying to find something that you want to get hold of that no one else has got and stuff. And that's what I like get excited about when I'm DJing. If people come and see me play, chances are they're going to hear music that. They might not be able to get for a year, whether it's my music or someone else's. You you want to keep that enthusiasm when people are ch chasing that music, or they know that if they're coming to see you play, they're going to hear those tracks that they haven't got, which natural excitement, you know. I mean, I recently had um, I did a charity, uh, a twelve-hour DJ set for a restart charity. I'm a trustee of, and I got different people to come to my 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 house to do it, and I had like shapeshifters in Simon Dunmore, Low Stepper, all these guys, and Simon Dunmore left his USB key. Oh, mate. That is a dangerous oh, thing to be doing. It was like the greatest moment. I was like, I, I was tidying up and I, I found this You're going to be admitting to this as well. I'm admitting to it. I'm admitting to it. I called him up. I called oh, him okay, up. Okay. I called him up. Because I'm not that big a prick. I called him up. But it was just like... Just completely just copied. It was like it was like that moment where like, you're just, just, just moving some beer cans out of the way. And there's like, there's two USBs. And I, I thought, oh, I put them into my computer. And one was just like someone's effects. And I was like, right. fuck off. In the bin. And then I put this. And it was like, and it said like, I was like, 
Oh my God. <laughs> oh my God. Holy God. Holy... <laughs> yeah, I was like, and uh, what I said to him actually is I rang him up and he said, he says, James, that's what music's for sharing, everything else like that. But I didn't lift anything yeah, because yeah. I was like, I felt bad. Like I thought it was like daylight robbery. If he'd given it to me and sure, said, yeah, 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 I did feel, but it was like a great moment because there was some unreleased stuff on there. Yeah, yeah. But, but I also. I, I I could never play it because I put it on my radio show. It's unreleased. Someone's yeah. going to go, where have you where got have that you got from? from? And I'm like, I've nicked it off Simon Dunwell's <laughs> USB that I sent back recorded delivery. So I can't, so I can't have, uh, unfortunately it was great in some ways and in yeah. some ways otherwise. But what was actually quite nice, and I admit it was quite nice to see how he structured his set yeah. and just what, what, what he did with stuff like that. But I yeah. I, I, I sent it back recorded delivery. Uh, but I do, play. I do think sometimes when I sometimes I see DJs, I'd love to just lean over, pull the USB and just <laughs> and fucking just run out of the club. Yeah. yeah. I've seen people do records like back in the day, a long time ago, you know, you'd see people that would just and they're off, you know, <laughs> grab the whole thing. I've seen people try and grab whole decks. Really? It's insane, yeah. And that's another thing. When we're going back to sort of the amount of music, you know, in this sort of 90s, early 2000s, and obviously way before that, I'll just say the 90s because that's when my experience started. But you've got people playing in clubs and they're only really taking 80 records. I mean, 80 tunes on the USB now is like pff, pittance. You know, yeah. you can put fucking thousands on that. I think my. I play with a mini um, little, like a hard drive, like one terabyte hard drive that I plug into the USB thing. And that will hold, I mean, God knows how many, but you know. Millions of songs that, yeah. Millions, yeah. But when you consider that you used to tour the world with a record box, you know, you want to make sure your stuff's, one, the most upfront, or two, stuff that people haven't got because you've only got those records. Another thing to think, consider with that is if you're playing out and something's not working, you're quite limited on what you can, where you can go because you're like, well, they're not into that and I've only got 40 disco records in. They don't like disco, so I'm fucked. Yeah. You know, but now you can really on your USB or where, whatever it is that you're using to draw your music from, you can go wherever because yeah. you've got it all with you. That's what I like. That's why I take such a big memory stick because I'm like, for whatever reason, if I need to go in a different direction or something's impromptu and you end up playing on a beach before you go and do something else, you've got the music for it. Yeah. But it's also because you're a good selector because your your concern is, is, a, is about the crowd. Yeah. It's not... I think and we'll come on to a little bit later these, but I think there's too many DJs I see out there they're going to play what they're going to play regardless of what the audience is doing Yeah. and I've been lucky to, to, to get to know like guys like yourself Nick Fanchuli Simon Dunmore all these people and one thing I always talk about the common theme is is you're there to play and get the crowd moving and that's yeah. whenever I think and obviously I play you know a wide variety of kind of quite weird gigs like a lot of uni stuff and everything else and there's my own personal preferences and my sole objective is to get everyone dancing Yeah. and, it, and it's I want to be cooler. Like I'd love to be, you know, more play more edgy music. But you're not there to educate people. You're there to make have a good time. Yes. And then what Simon always said is play two for them and one for you. Yeah. I mean, you've got to get a balance. And also, you know, that sort of concept of, you know, pl playing what you want and or playing for the crowd, that still has to sort of also be reflected in the people that are playing before you or after you or warm up DJs or residents and stuff like that. There's there's so many times where I've turned up to do a gig and the guy before me is absolutely levering out all my tunes at, at a ridiculously fast pace. But but in their eyes, they might be seeing that as a sort of respect. Yeah, I really like your music. I'm playing, and I'm like, well, what the fuck am I going to play? Because I'm booked to come and turn up and play. You've just played everything before me. You finished your set on my biggest track, and you're 10 BPM faster than what I'd normally play. So you're like, it's fucked already. You can't go anywhere with that. So you really need to have a, a respect for who you're playing yeah. with and a respect for what people want to hear and what else, what someone else does. But the key thing that we all do is you're right make people dance play play to a crowd and and, and get them excited you know because i read that early what you just said i read that early someone bought me when i decided to get into djing like a book on djing and yeah. i was like uh, you know like how to yeah yeah like a how to <laughs> like, like yeah, yeah basically i actually someone bought me the dumb uh, there is a the how there is a dummies guide to djing right. which i have bought but someone bought me but i haven't read someone bought me this other th other book on djing when i first started i think someone trying to be sweet and i know yeah, like yeah. All, cause, like your journey and djing already is like way more cooler <laughs> romanticized than me going i want to be a dj but i read in the book and one thing it did say was find out who's playing before you yeah find out who's playing after you are you the main event where do you stand on it don't play that person's music who's coming after you because they want to do it yeah but so i do that i try i always call up the the, the promoter and i said right who's playing before me and some you know and the, <laughs> some of the things like like, like a bit of band i was like well i can't you know <laughs> stand you up can't, comedian yeah, yeah you can't you can't it was like old people's home some guy on a violin so yeah. you can't so, so I consider that, and then you say who's playing after you, like your headline, you can go where you want. Obviously, because yeah. I'm in, in a wanky 
celebrity DJ Z list of thing. You kind of you kind of can do what you fucking like of because course. because because they're not there to see you as a DJ. They're there to see you as James Haskell, ex rugby player. I'm a celebrity person. <laughs> and what I always like is when I turn up and the DJ and they go, "Oh my god, you can actually DJ." I was like, "Yeah, what did you think I was going to do? Plug in uh, pre-recorded mixing and I'm, just stand there." Yeah, like. I'm like, "I've got three decks. Well, you know, why do you need three decks? Because I'm fucking using acapellas and doing three deck mixing, like which is great. Oh, yeah, which was what I want to do because I, I take the same approach to DJing as I do to sport. It's like taking it really seriously. Yeah, but I've turned up to things like that. I did a uni thing. It was like. 3,000 people, and the guy was playing before I was on 135, 140. I'm um, like drum and bass, like the, the hardest shit. Like, and I was like, How am I supposed to follow that? And yeah. so, but I, what I did, I just boom, echoed it out, echoed it out, silence. Wait for five minutes wait, wait. until everyone's like, What's happening? Yeah, yeah, and then just started on like, Yeah, you know, or re a reset. Yeah, I couldn't because I, I, I remember asking, I think I asked Simon about this. I said to him, What, what do you, and he goes, Nah, just. I want a distinct difference between what I'm doing and someone else. And I, I, there's no way I'm blending into 140. I didn't even have... Like, I, I have a lot of music, like you said, to see where things are going to go. But I was like, I'm refusing to do this. It's not my It's not no. my thing. And it also sets you up on the back foot because you're thinking, well, you know, even bringing people's heart rates... Because obviously your heart rate tends to be at the BPM you're sort of listening to, you're dancing, everything else. Jumping from one to the other, I mean, your, your first half an hour is a slog because <laughs> people are like, oh, fuck me. Like, because it's going to have dropped down. Yeah. But... You know, it, 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 you're right. You've just got to sort of adapt to the environment. And, you know, I'd also think is where you get a lot of people that might play before you that are warm up DJs or whatever. If it's their one gig of the last six months, they tend to, that's their headline slot, you know. Yeah. So they tend to play all the tunes they've been buying and this and that. And sometimes it doesn't work in that environment. So that, that just comes with a bit of education, I think. Can, I want to take you back to your first DJ gig, not your bedroom gig. Okay. Can you remember your first? your first playing out where someone's you might not have even paid you but someone might have asked you because sometimes I when I've interviewed some DJs before or spoken to them sometimes their first gig was they pestered someone to let them on and do something were you did you did that how it started or was someone paid you or you you know my first do you mean like a, in, in, in um... first time you played to a crowd like yeah. an actual crowd uh, well that would have probably been as basic as one of my um, girlfriends when I was a teen her dad got married he was a bit of a raver, and the reception, like a marquee in some farmer's field or whatever, he, he let a few of us play at the reception. So there was obviously that's the first time playing to sort of a, a, a large, well, would you say a large group of people, but a good sort of 70, 80 people um, as a teenager. But that was again, you're with the mates that you've learned in the bedrooms doing it with, so it all felt quite comfortable. And if anything, it was just exciting to get to play out. And then from that, I think you probably look at start, starting to look at sort of function room, uni, uni or college kind of stuff where you're playing to sort of small crowds. Um, but weirdly, the biggest jump for me was my first proper paid gig. Was in Canada, <laughs> fucking mad. So I'm like obviously DJing a lot, um, uh, doing sort of music stuff locally with friends. And when you're playing in pubs and stuff like this, no money in it. You're just more that your friends have put it on. It's still a crowd of people that you don't know, but it's obviously very intimate. And then my first sort of proper paid gig where I was offered some money um, was to play in Canada. I think it was uh, Calgary in Canada. Um, so I sort of jumped in two-footed and was like on a flight on my own, flew over to Canada, met these guys and performed there, and it was mental. And then obviously, so I, I didn't really do it half half heartedly. No. I sort of jumped straight <laughs> you went in, straight from straight on tour, straight into Canada, and then come back and was like, wow, wicked. And then a week later, you've got a couple of hundred quid in the bank. Yes. And what was that it's Canadian gig like? What kind of music were you playing at, at that, that time? It was like some more sort of uh, hard house techno, like faster stuff, like you know early on. Um, early 2000s. My first release that I ever had out was 2002, I think. Um, again, made in the bedroom on the sort of equipment that you got on finance type stuff. Um, and so, yeah, it was around that sort of time, just kind of all sort of it happened quite quickly. And then when I came back from that gig, I started doing the sort of circuit up and down the motorway, playing small shows, Manchester or London or wherever else. And it kind of started to get some sort of momentum, really. And so you went, actually went in quite hard with the hard house to start with, as yeah, opposed like Tony to... Yeah, Tony and stuff like that, and okay. Lisa Lashes, and... Yeah, I actually... I had, I've had a DJ was... lesson from Lisa Lashes. Yeah, so she's wicked. Like, yeah. She is an absolute legend. She's I mean, amazing. Obviously, she's got the Manchester School of Music. Yeah. And, like, that is perfect for getting people into the scene and, you know, structuring music and DJing and all that. She's And she is a... 
Obviously, she's an ambassador on the NTIA, which I'm associated with those guys as well, the nighttime industries, who've done a great load of work during this whole pandemic in like, giving everyone a voice and speaking up for everyone. But she's she's perfect. because yeah, Lisa, someone introduced because basically I I'd heard of Lisa, right, yeah. obviously, but the hard house scene. But she's transitioned obviously into much more into techno sure, now. Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I and a friend of ours through the RPA, the Rugby Players Association, was doing some some career stuff. And I said, when I still play, and I've taken up DJ, and I've actually so when I took up DJing, someone said, "Oh, why are you taking up DJing? Because I just want to play." And, yeah. and my reasons for DJing and and, and is. I was in Las Vegas and I remember walking out into the Hard Rock Hotel pool area and I just saw this person standing at the front controlling everybody's mood. Yeah. Everybody's all the attention was on him. They were playing tunes and the sun was shining. I was like, I just associated with that. And I was like, yeah. I'm an attention whore. Yeah. I, I, I love that kind of music. My taste changed. I was like, why would I not want to do it? Plus the technology, because I'm yeah. absolutely keen over technology. We've talked, we'll, we'll talk later about your connection with Pioneer. And that's why I fell in love with it. And, um, and I said to the guy at the RPA, look, I'm... I want to do this thing. And he goes, well, I know Lisa Lashes. So she, she spoke to her, hooked her, got talking to her. Yeah. She said, you want to come over to my house? I've got to set up and teach me. And we did, um, oh, we had like a three-hour techno rave out. And I got to yeah, play yeah. techno with her. She was Perfect. amazing. We stayed in touch. She's, she's asked about coming to the, doing stuff at the school and playing some gig stuff for them. Because I think um, she's got Carl Cox. A few other people are going to do something there. I'm sure you'll get the, the, yeah, the, the yeah. nod to go and do something there. Um, and... Uh, yeah, she's she's absolutely brilliant. So that was where your your hardcore sort of stuff. Yeah, and then uh, your sort of trajectory is it, is it you've now changed into is it because you're much more ravey now or, or, or is that yeah? Why I wrong? mean, I sort of I guess um, coming out of that sort of hard house scene um, and kind of acid techno, I suppose, similar sort of BPM, all that, all that sort of stuff. I was playing some of the London labels like Stay Up Forever and, and stuff like this. Then I. Um, all of all of my group of friends that I keep referring to in terms of when we were make, playing music and DJing together and stuff like that, we all had different styles of music. Well, some some might be total house heads, some were more of the techno, some were drum and bass. So you just sort of start transitioning into what your other friends are into. You know, it's like you go to a festival and events. If there's 10 of you, none of you, you it's like, oh, we're going to this tent, they're going to that tent. And you sort of start to get influenced by other sounds. And um, certainly when I was making music uh, with Dave Robertson, we sort of, he was more into the house, tech house, that sort of stuff. So we went down that route and we were going up to Fabric and seeing like Terry Francis and Nathan Coles. Richie Horton, Ricardo Villalobos, and it just I just sort of moved into that and felt like more at home with that sound, really. So that's where that the sort of techno route started, and then it just, I guess you just, you, when, when you're in there, you're sort of lit in that scene then, and you kind of move with it. Because one thing, the advice people always gave me is is to sort of almost find your sound and what what your what your authentic you know what your authenticity comes from yeah and you say that that now that kind of techno vibe is 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 what you yeah but your own sort of distinct version like the we are brave stuff your music yeah, yeah you, you know. i think like and, and also like basically when i started getting better at producing i was kind of bringing in the rave and the vocal elements into that sort of music it's quite funny because when i was first signed to drum code probably 2007 2008 uh, techno had, had, was going for a, a weird period before that a couple of years before that it was like minimal so the kind of Marco Carolla um, Richie Horton it was almost quite plinky plonky I sort of came away from that a bit and was like I'm not massively into this sound now it's like you know ruffling a crisp packet and tapping on the table can't you it's like <laughs> yeah, yeah, what is this yeah, you know what yeah, I mean yeah. I didn't really I didn't have a, re a relationship with it um, so I sort of went back in the studio and was just working on music and then around that sort of time sent some demos to Adam Bayer and got my first drum code. And weirdly, that had a vocal in it. You didn't really get a lot of vocals at all in techno. It was like... Yeah, but that's the kind of techno I like. Of that's course, yeah. yeah. And then that's that sort of... I sort of... People will say I sort of pioneered that sound quite early on in the sort of mid-2000s because now all of that music is like that. And that whole ravey, big vocal drops, big snare builds and, you know. Yeah. So I, I'm sort of proud of the fact that I was at the forefront of that and kind of started introducing those ravey elements, which now people call it the sort of British techno vibe and whatever else. But that sort of gave birth to a scene that is now huge, you know. I but mean, I think it's a lot more of a palatable scene. It's not it's not so closed off, I think, that kind of scene, you know, like you know, the music you're producing, the you know, the stuff Adam Bear losing your mind. It's pulled in yeah. it's pulled in a lot of other genres and became its own thing now. Yeah. But yeah, certainly that's a massive track. And when I was, you know, first into Adam Bear years ago, we're really good friends though. We've known each other for twenty years or whatever. But I mean we, we, at that stage 
um, our, the old Adam Bayer tracks there was no vocals and it was loopy tribal kind of and so you know we're all kind of doing it now and I think it's really found its own yeah its own life that's my kind of I just I'm just well we're going to talk about it a bit later on, but I'm just sad because I, I I want to play more of that I'd love yeah. to do it but I, you know I just not cool enough for uh, I, just, <laughs> I just think you got you got you got to play what you got to do I know that's like, why in the radio know, show I always the last twenty minutes yeah always I put that have a little up, section where you can kind of do what your I mean. own thing, and then yeah. and then people go well you don't play that well actually funny you say that I actually <laughs> do up. and I've got a playlist. And I'm, I'm willing to do a gig for you. Um, what were there any moments like with DJing or anything that's super surreal when you thought, "Fuck, I've made this"? Like, when was your sort of your big part? You know, um, I don't think that ever that ever really sinks in. What what you what I do find nowadays is um, what the lockdown thing has definitely shown me is to not take for granted what you did have compared to where you are now. I was doing shows, 10, 15 shows up to, up to sometimes a month, hammering all over the place, you know. And then when you're in that machine, you never really look back and think, oh, that gig was insane. Well, that was, <laughs> yeah. Obviously you do because you come off and you're like, that was wicked. But that whole kind of pinch yourself moments, I guess, you would get, I still get them now, you know, when I'm, Obviously, in terms of production stuff, when you're doing like an essential mix of Radio One or CD for Fabric or mix for this or mix for that, that they're they're sort of pivotal moments in your career. But then when you're, I've got my own festival in Ireland at Alan Fitzpatrick's Day, which is on Paddy's Day and stuff, you know, and selling out Warehouse Project with my We Are the Brave um, label and you know, playing to twenty thousand people in the steel yard at Creamfields and them all singing your tracks back to you. Those moments are always going to be amazing, you know. Um, but they're, they're they're the sort of ones you. But come, do you realise how and... amazing it, that is, though? Because I know, like, I look back at my career, and the thing I talked about in my in my book is my biggest regret is not celebrating the little things because you're always on to the next thing and you always exactly, want to yeah. be, get better. If you've got a growth mindset, it's it can be your recipe for success and why you reach the top. But if you don't ever appreciate what you did, because having that filling out that room, like I've yeah. seen footage of what you do and have the whole room eating out the palm of your hand. Yeah. And you will control their night and they're going to come away and go, fuck me, Alan Fitzpatrick actually blew the doors off it tonight. Yeah. Do you know, do you like appreciate how yeah, special I, it is I, now? I do, but I'm, I'm very similar in the mindset that you just referred to, whereas I will, it's not ungrateful, it's I'm massively grateful for doing that show and coming off, but I'll come off and I'll be like, we'll do a bigger one next time, whatever. It's like <laughs> yeah, the next yeah, thing. Yeah, you know, yeah. It's not like, I mean, I love it. It's insane. Obviously, it's 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 great. But what I do, that's what I'm saying. The sort of lockdown thing has made you be appreciating the, the smaller things, mm. you know, appreciating the fact that that was insane. You know, not always to come away and go, right, chasing the next thing. You know, making sure that you can better it every time. But that's natural. I mean, I I'm one of those people. I'm very ambitious. So I'll jump two foot into everything, and if I can't do something, I'll just try and do it or whatever. So chasing. The sort of um, the need to want to do things better and bigger every time is, I think, for me, is a natural thing. I'm super competitive as well. I want to win. I want to do, you know, the best of what I'm doing at. Same as you know, being a sportsman. Mm. That's it, you can't get out of that. You, you would put that into everything you do. Yeah. Which I, you know, you, you you always want that that sort of need to go right. Okay, well, that was wicked. How do we do it better? You know what I mean? Was there ever a moment that there's some DJs that you'd looked up to, like you said, the Richie Hortons, the the guys that you'd, or, or being in that scene, and then got to play with them? Or was there, you know, that point where you sat in, the, you know, you you were passing someone to get onto the stage, yeah. and you're like, fuck it, now I've used to watch you or whatever. Well, you still get that mad stuff now. I mean, even going back to sort of the Lisa Lashes thing, which is quite a weird. Um, Thing back in the day, I had posters of her on my wall. You know, it was like <laughs> yes. I was like 14, 15 years old, going clubbing and seeing people like that. And then a few years later, you're you're putting I'm putting Lisa on the guest list to come and see me play with Carl Cox at Space in Ibiza. So like it's weird, you I know. And it's like yeah. I, one at one point I'm sort of you're the poster boy of of this scene, and then you're you're playing music together and stuff, you know. But I still get that now. I mean, I'm a massive fan of people like you know Sasha and stuff and then I, then when you get the opportunity to not just be on the record label but then play back to back with these people you're like this is mad it is still mad but I don't think that ever goes do you have know? a favorite back to back moment that you've that you've done um probably um hide out a couple of years ago back to back with scream um impromptu back to back as well he was playing before me or or vice versa either way we had the last 4 hours it was either him and me or me and him and we just decided let's just play together for the for that period of time rather than doing our separate sets and 
it was just one of them ones where you know it was the last set sun's rising the location in croatia is amazing behind us you've got every dj that was playing on that night all come to sort of see us play and all hanging out and it's just one of their moments where like you never you never repeat it it just happened yeah yeah but it was one of those ones you look around and then all the people that you want to be showing off to or you want to be hanging out with they're all there you know so it was like it was wicked do you still get the um you know so so when i do a dj gig um, and bizarrely, when I was, when I first got into this, guy said, "Why are you get into it?" Because I just want to play music. He said, "You're not going to make any money out of it. You're not going to do this. You know, you know, you're always going to be known as this." I said, "Fine," but that was like red rag to a ball. Yeah, I got paid from the first thing I ever did. Yeah, my first thing was Ministry of Sound on the balcony. Where I got to play. I was like, "This is <laughs> this is amazing. <laughs> good start. <laughs> it's good, not bad start." Yeah, yeah. And then some of the crowds I do like I did uh, was five thousand people. Me headline for five thousand people. Like, yeah. it's not like a like a small room. I was like, "This is amazing," and I get the same excitement and same nerves as. I did DJing in front of anybody um, as I did playing. And I get the same relation. So I walk up and I just... The motion is I'm listening to tunes that make me feel amazing. Yeah. You're, you're getting people's attention. What do you feel when you... Even now when you go out and play and like you have that moment at hideout? What like what emotions are you... You, you just... It's almost out of body, isn't it? You're sort of, you know, looking at that, thinking this is, this is insane, this is mental. What, what I kind of relate to is I go back in my own kind of way of thinking of what I was like when I was younger and you're looking out at people and you know in theory these people are remembering this moment for the next 20 years they'll be talking to someone else about it in 20 years time as I've got memories of stuff like that so it's being in control of that it is the buzz but I, I will get the same feeling whether I'm performing to 10 people or 20,000 it's just playing and entertaining people if anything the, the smaller gigs at the nerve-wracking ones because you can see everyone's eyes. Yeah. You know? Everyone's looking at you. What's he doing there? You yeah. Know? Whereas you're playing to 20,000 people and you almost... It's just fucking sea of people and they're all, it's all going off. But you couldn't pinpoint people no. if, unless you were really looked at the front row. Yeah. You know? So you're sort of... I guess you know, you're always free to do what you want, but you feel a lot more. It feels a lot more intense when it's smaller. Yeah. Whereas people, when you say that to people, they probably think actually that's backward way of thinking. Walking out to 20,000 people. It's probably more daunting. Imagine than, playing something that's insane. You know, that, mate. It's, yeah, it's, like, it's nuts. What? Um, so, do you still get nervous though? Do you still feel no? You after the experience? Oh, I um, no, not hugely, which okay. is weird. I mean, I do occasionally get a little bit of butterflies and stuff. I think I'm going to now, going back into okay. it, but it will settle. I, I, it's not an arrogance, I guess, but there is, there is, there's always a degree of. Smash it. Yeah, you know what I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know that it sounds. Been here, done it. You, you know, you, you, you've got. I've done it so many times, yeah. and you've got so much memory, so much stuff locked in the memory bank of like, if you ever had any self doubt, you've done. I've done this a million times. Oh, I've blown the door off it. I had doors uh, off it. And also, almost like if there was any nerves, I mean, it's on the big ones, you know, just use like Glastonbury or whatever. Playing, I think I played before Carl um, in the Arcadia stage at Glastonbury, and you got well, I don't know how many thousand people watching you at, at Glastonbury. And you get you get sort of nervous walking up, and then you're sort of you play your intro, and your sort of belly's going, and then bang, the first drop, and everyone roars. You're like, I mean, I've, I've, <laughs> easy. Do you know what I mean? It's like you yeah. get, it sounds like an arrogant approach, but you need a bit of arrogance. You need a bit of you need a bit of ego to be able to perform in those sort of environments. But for me, it's it's not an arrogance. It's more of a confidence of like I love this. I love playing music, and I love entertaining people, and I love seeing the smiling faces of people from all walks of life enjoying something together and being in control of the mood and taking people on the journey that's the sort of buzz of like you know why you sort of get that confidence with it i think do you have um without obviously um putting people off do you have like a, or upsetting people because you haven't mentioned them do you have like a favorite like crowd that always like when alan fitzpatrick rolls up they're like you're like this, you know, like maybe with awakenings or UK or yeah, Glastonbury, yeah. where where you know you're going to get a mega reception. For me, um, the Irish crowd are amazing. Playing in Ireland is just they're just fucking mad. They just have it. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like and and Scotland as well. It's just like tops off. Let's have a rave. You oh, know? really? Like, and the just the enthusiasm of people. I mean, obviously, when you're if, when you're putting a lineup together and you've You've booked the, the, the first DJ, if you're doing a festival, the first DJ's on at four in the afternoon. The energy that he's got, multiple times I've had guys playing the warm-up set and they've been like, come off being like, that was insane. It filled up within half an hour and everyone's fucking really <laughs> pumping away. And, you know, that, that energy from the start right to the end of the night, whoever's playing carries through. That's the sort of you know, passion that you want. 
Argentina as well. I mean, love going over there, and it's just, I mean, everywhere's everywhere's wicked. These yeah. are some. I don't want people to think. Oh, I can only think so. That's what I mean. I would oh, want to the stick... Berlin people yeah. be like, yeah, yeah, they're all there, sort of scratching and drinking the flat white, you know. <laughs> yeah. But everyone's loving it. I mean, it's, yeah. everywhere, everywhere's great. But yeah, certainly, I think I've got a, I've got a fond relationship with the Irish because obviously being a Fitzpatrick, partly Irish, you know, heritage and stuff. I think they've adopted me as one of their own, and and you know, very thankful for that because it does it does go off, you know. Is there... what was your schedule like? Give me an example of what your normal kind of travel thing would be like i don't know say in the summer in, I in ibiza um yeah i mean the weekends were very very much all over the place you know you sort of especially in the summer the summer is probably the most brutal where you're looking at doing things like four or five shows of a, of a, of a day sometimes or of a weekend um, if you're on the continent you could be playing a festival in belgium and then you could be driving to france and then you know going to another, you know, another city, Germany, and then finishing up in Holland, or sort of all on one day. Really? Yeah. So it can be kind of bonkers. You're all over the place, you know. And then so, but but obviously to do that because you're consistently performing. I imagine if you went to each place, got smashed up. By the time you finish, you're get gonna... to the last one. And the promoter's like, "This guy's a right dick." <laughs> it's like loads of fun because you just like you know sunglasses on, hood up, trying to sort of sleep in the backstage. And that has happened sometimes. You that that will happen sometimes, and in the same way as that whole rock and roll ethos yeah. wouldn't exist if that didn't happen. Yeah. Right through the genres of music, whether it's, you know, rock and roll right down to dance music or whatever. That sort of stuff will happen. Is it quite exciting, though, like, you know, jumping on a private jet, flying for one thing to do this? Did you, yeah. You know. I mean, it's a buzz. You know, I yeah. mean, it's one of them things... I always say you, you have to enjoy it now because no, no, one ever, no one ever led on their deathbed and thought... Shouldn't have got on that private jet and really done that. Everyone no. would be like, I was sick. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. Most people's regrets in life is not doing things that they they sort of pulled themselves away from doing because it was an opportunity that they thought, mm, you know, be safe, do the right thing, but have an element of kind of you know, rogueness about what you do and, and go and have fun while you can do it because we'll all be old one day and you'll be looking back thinking, oh, I didn't do that. Do you know what I mean? I have, you ever, that. have you ha ever had to rein it in? Has anyone had to take you to one side going, well, you are doing too much? No, I don't think I've ever been. I've, I've been quite. I've had a good, quiet sort of, you know, personal sort of filter on. Mine. Def, definitely on touring, and I mean, there's definitely been times where you're like, I've said to my agent, that just don't, don't give me any shows this month, or I'm absolutely shattered. I need some time to just, you know, because as I say, you get caught up in the machine of it. You're getting paid loads of money, you're traveling all over the world, you're playing, playing, playing music to people that adore what you're doing. It's very difficult to then say no to a gig. You know, you get caught up in that sort of thing. But you don't need to be doing that those sort of amount of shows, and you don't need to be. Yeah, because you it cause you said you said actually um, uh, at the start of the intro of the podcast you said you probably do less shows now yeah. when you're going back into it. Do you 100%. think is it sustainable? Do you think you reckon you can do that? Because once you're on it, you're like. I mean, ask me and if we do this in a year's time, fine. and I'm here with my sunglasses <laughs> on and my hood up, going yeah, <laughs> then we know that that was all bullshit. But I mean, you know, as I say, I'm only 37, so I'm I'm sure I'll be doing this for a long a long time and. I would like to take that view into, I would say, you know, 2.0 of the world when we right. go back and try and filter off some of the things you don't need to be doing and hammering the touring. However, we it, that may be out of my hands. If we do these kind of, um, well, the different restrictions on other countries and travel passports and negative tests, it might be harder to tour like we used to anyway. Yeah. So that may not be a choice of mine. It might may just go that way. You know, I mean, I very can't see how we're going to be jumping in and out of countries very quickly until they sort this visa stuff out. Yeah, because you know, they would, you know, that 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 whole process might need to rethink because I just don't know how we're going to be able to do it. So some of those restrictions might cause us to just do less anyway. Fine, okay. But I'd like I'd like to approach it probably as doing, you know, um, quality over quantity. Fine, okay. But when you when, was one of the hardest things is there sleep deprivation the hardest thing for what you do because you. I want to ask you about how you prepare for stuff, but a lot of your stuff will be quite. Unless you're doing festivals, you're quite uh, like late. You're like main actors on sort of one, one, two in the morning. Yeah, or if you're playing in Berlin, you start at six or seven a.m. You know, so sometimes it's, you know, yeah, you just got to get your rest. And do you ever like? Ever, do you ever find you? Because obviously, you know, I do some health and fitness stuff as the other interest. And obviously, sleep deprivation and stuff for yeah. people. Uh, and it's, it's like a massive cause. It like hammers your body. Like you're not meant to not sleep. Oh, I know so many people in this industry that have, have ducked out of it because of all these sort of things. You know, travel anxiety, no sleep, turning them into people that they not necessarily thought that they were. You know, because you're just not not getting. As you know, if you if you don't get kip, it's fucking horrible. Yes. Like it's, and it is 
a slog. Everything's hard work, and sometimes you just need a good night's sleep. Yeah. You know? But I've been big on the sort of CBD stuff. I've been gathering the oil drops and stuff yeah. and all that sort of stuff now helps with sleep, helps with like aches and pains, anxiety and all that sort of stuff, you know. There's ways of, of, of kind of looking after yourself more, but certainly getting a good night's sleep is probably the one remedy that everyone should do. And I think go, you know, with all this sort of lockdown stuff, that's why I say it's probably added a few years on my life because it's the most, <laughs> it's most time in a sort of single period where I've, I'm, sometimes I'm yawning and going to bed at 9pm or yeah. whatever, waking up at 8 in the morning, no alarms, and just sort of naturally getting that amount of sleep. When I look back to sort of pre-COVID, I was... You know, some weekends you're you're getting home on a Sunday, and then the family want to go out for a roast. The kids want to play with you. You want to go over the park and play football, and you're like, oh, you've had an hour and a half sleep. Not necessarily because you've deliberately stayed up or anything, no. just because the schedule's done that to you. Or you've got when when you finally get on a three hour flight, and you think you're gonna get some sleep. Someone massive in the middle aisle that's leaning all over you and whatever else. And you're like, I can't get any space, and, and you just you get irritable. Yeah, you can't, yeah. can't rest. Sleeping. On demand is one thing you sort of learn as a DJ as well. If you can grab forty minutes somewhere, you tend to do that sort of stuff. But do you look at your? Do you look at things like your your rider and stuff that you that you have and yeah. and think to yourself, when I go back into it, could I be more healthy? Because the thing is, I, I, you know, if you fill it full of tequila, champagne, and everything else like that, yeah. The one thing I, having been a sportsman, then trying to do get into that world and doing stuff and actually you know DJing um I love the because I because I have it's such a novelty you know doing a fe- like doing a festival thing and doing something doing two two yeah. gigs in a day was like a mega thing for me I yeah, loved yeah, it yeah. um but I'm terrible without like without sleep or play you know and I I tried to think about my rider because I was like right put shampoo and do this and then like, my, my missus went but you haven't going to eat and like put some decent food on it put this thing put some water on it do something else and this yeah. is obviously like I'm a non-event in this world <laughs> for someone like yourself who's doing that many things do you look back now and think it's probably some wise decisions where maybe one out of every gig that month you might go hard the rest of it you seem like you're having a good time but you're just being ultimately professional yeah. is it possible to do that or are you not built like that yeah I think so I mean certainly in terms of like making sure you've got like fresh fruit and, and, and stuff like that on your rider and stuff to eat or, or, or making sure that there's the ability to get a good meal or some proper food in you and you're not drinking so much it's, a lot of times you turn up might be the fourth gig in the weekend and you've, you've arrived and you've got backstage in your cabin or whatever and everything's there it's all good your rider's on, on point and you say to the promoter right I'd really like to get some I haven't eaten in 24 hours really because I've been travelling I'd like to get something hot and something to, you know, to eat if you've got anything healthy and they're like well we've got cheesy chips or something like that you know, yeah. that sort of stuff winds me up because yeah. I'm like have a, have a sort of think about what where people have been and what people have been doing and maybe give them an option to have something better than that. Do you know yeah. what I mean? And then you end up, oh, oh, I might eat some salted peanuts and a banana and then uh, you know, 12 hours later you finally get some dinner. That yeah. sort of stuff again fucks around with your your mind because you're not giving your body all the stuff it needs. One, it hasn't had enough sleep. Two, it hasn't had any calories and it all goes out the window. But It must be hard for you as well because you, cause of all the other mates you've got in the DJ world and some of the similar gigs is that because you don't see these people, every time you see them oh, it's sorry. like... Alan, you like put them beers. You are like fuck, and you, and you said you weren't going to do it. Oh, I, mate, I, I, I that... think the secret would be, like I said, is choosing one month and just being ruthless. Is going actually listen. This is business. I've got four. I've done five gigs today, mate. I'm just a straight water. As far as the crowd knows, I'm off my tits, but I'm exactly. actually on water and and, and stuff. That, that happens all the time. Fine. Happens all the time. There's and there's certain people that I know I can see at a gig, and and it will just go the other way <laughs> when you don't want it to. Yeah, do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And but you're right. When you when you're sort of touring and you're on the road and you bump into like your peers or or friends or other or other big DJs or whatever, there's there, there's never a time when you're in sync. So I would never turn up and go to headline a festival, walk into the backstage, and all the other DJs are like sipping on water, going, "Hi, how's it going? Green teas are out." Yeah, yeah. yeah. There'd be a couple, and there might be a couple of that, but generally the rule is that kind of you'd never be in sync. So there'd always be someone that comes, come on, shot, bosh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and then yeah, you're yeah. like straight, and then within an hour you're sat there, like, and I'm looking to the people I'm with, my tour manager or whatever, and else I'm like, every time. And then you. Who is, is there, a, is there a red flag? Can you name them a red flag person? Yeah, so if, if well, Scream is another good right, example. Okay. I have a great time with Ollie, he's wicked. But I'd like to, every time I see him, have, 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 have a party right. with people like that. And, you know, I have a lot of fun with Eats Everything. And I have a lot of. He I, seems like a really good guy. Yeah, I follow yeah. him on. And yeah, he seems like a top guy. He's and into a pop. So many, so many people that you, you know, you like to have a drink with and stuff. And then there's other people that, you know, I've had beers and stuff with, with, with Carl Cox and stuff. It, it, that, the last time I was with him, we, we got the tequilas out in, in Melbourne, in, in the sort of backstage before we. Um, 
before we were playing and stuff. But there's, there's a lot of the time, as you're saying, it's like you, you haven't seen people for yeah. ages. So your natural reaction, when you when you go and see your mates that you haven't seen for ages, you don't say, let's go to the pub and all have a spark in the water. You want to have a few beers. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. naturally, that, that kind of like feeling of, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah well, let's go and hang out, it's quite a natural thing. But I think, yeah, having that control on it. I'll say to my tour manager, I'll say to people I'm travelling with, well, this we're, this month we're not, you know, we're on, we're straight to bed, we're getting a good meal in us, we're going to get loads of sleep, dr just drink water, blah, 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 blah. And then for the most part, it'll be, it'll be it. decent, yeah. But it only takes one of you to go a bit sideways and then everyone goes, oh, for fuck's sake, and then it's off the other way. Have you like, ever got so melted that when you've got up on the decks and like in the sunlight's hit you or the night's hit you, you're like, fuck, I don't even know how to operate. <laughs> He's like, I can't use my hands anymore. Yeah. Like, Yeah, no, I mean, luckily, in touch wood, I've always been all right in that, in, in that sort of sense. But yeah, there's... There's, there's a lot of shows where sometimes it's when you, that's more when you're starting to get burnt out. I think fine when you're traveling too much, when you've done too many shows, and then you know you're playing in somewhere like uh, Vegas and it's fucking fifty degree heat on you, and you're sort of oh god, <laughs> and it's just like as as, as well as it's because what you've got to try and remember as well is all the people that are there to see you. If you assume the good a good rule to assume as a DJ is that there's a there's an amount of people in that crowd that have never seen you play. You want them to go away thinking that, that experience was wicked, you know. You don't want them to go away and thinking, yeah, it was a real letdown, you know what I mean? So you you have to always be on your game, even if you're feeling like dog shit. Yeah, you're like a constant walking business card. Exactly. All for everyone. Yeah. Their first impression, that's it. If you don't if you don't make it, that's amazing. Yeah, and same with anything. Someone goes to see, you know, if you go to the, whether, whether, it's, whether it's sport or whether it's music, you go and see someone that you're a fan of and they don't deliver. You will go away feeling disappointed and feeling like, Oh, do I want to go and see them again? So yeah. you, I, I think you always need to have an element of like this. Every every gig's like your last, or every gig is your wanting people to experience what they should be experiencing when they come to see you. Get what they pay for. You know what I mean? Can I just ask um, just a bit about your 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 kind of process? Like, how do you put? Um... I mean, you, so I mean, actually, go back. So, so, say for example, you've got that six in the morning thing, and you say you weren't coming. Would you sleep and then wake up to yeah. do that? Yeah, 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 definitely. I I, I tend to try and get my sleep in wherever I can. Oh, okay. If I'm playing, um, <laughs> as I'm getting older as well, I, the sort of gigs that I love, why does everything have to be open until 6, 7 in the morning? I don't know. Like, why the fuck don't people start at, like, 11 in the morning yeah. and then go to bed and then finish at 7pm and go to bed? You know, yeah. People now be like, that's showing your A's now. You're yeah. like, yeah. But, no, you know, I know what you mean. I know what you mean. Like, I, I... Day, day events are great. Yeah. Festivals are great. When, when, you've, when you've headlined somewhere or you've played somewhere or you've just been on the bill or, or you've warmed up for someone or whatever else and you're like, oh, wicked, it's like half 7 in the evening and I'm done. Um, that's great, you know. Yeah. But th those sort of late night ones, you know, I do try and grab grab rest in between. So if I'm playing at four in the morning, I'll make sure that the flight or the travel gets us to the hotel where we can go grab some scran, get some food down us, get in bed, and then maybe wake up an hour before the gig. Fine. So you you almost feel like you've you know certainly maybe like you're playing for breakfast because you've got up at that time and then when you're up you're up so those morning those, those morning ones are right i did uh i had to do like a, a union one like three in the morning or two whatever and i slept before that. and that sensation of waking up at like two in the morning yeah it I, it's like being kicked in the bollocks and someone's hit you on there it's like I, I, does it ever get any easier it's no. like horrific yeah i mean one thing that i am i can get sort of a bit nervy about now is i haven't I've not done that for so long. So that whole getting up in the middle of the night. The weirdest thing when you're when you're especially when you're touring, I get this so often, which probably ties into other people when they get anxiety of, of travelling and stuff, but that wake when your alarm goes off in a hotel and it's three AM and you wake up and you think, Where the fuck am I now? <laughs> I have no... Where am I? And your heart's gone mental because you've just woken up in the middle of the night from a deep sleep. Yeah. So you're sort of, oh, God. You go to the toilet, you sort of get some water on your face, you think, right. And sometimes that can literally be, you'll be like, I'm playing in half an hour. And, like, you've, you've sort of... And then yeah. You, you get in the car, the driver's, how's it going, wicked, get in the car, walk into the club, bang, you sort of switch into performance, performance mode. mode. And then you play. And people wonder why when you... you know, there's obviously a lot of people that will come off... Come off of shows and then they'll get them do a line of coke or they'll yeah. do this or do that. A lot of that is to try and keep that level off where you're sort of trying to find where you are. Do you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. But there is a, there is a sort of you can wake up and be like I don't know what's going on here. I'm, oh yeah, of course we're in Switzerland in this hotel and I've got to play because your brain just sort of goes oh, I'm at home in bed and then you wake up I'm not I've got another gig which is wicked. But that whole teaching yourself to get back yeah. in that mode 
It's a tough one sometimes. How do you um, how do you plan to perform? Do you, do you have a vague idea of where you're going to start, like a track list together, not like a radio show, or do you have a f- folder of sixty tracks that you're playing at the moment and just go and you've know them inside out? Yeah, I sort I never really go in with too much of a plan. I, I have a loose a loose plan. If I'm going to play a two hour set, which is probably pretty standard, um, what you go through forty tracks maybe. I might have a playlist of 150 tracks and some are kind of those rescue you type tracks where you might want to create a moment all the new stuff you want to play all the promos all the stuff you've got upcoming on the label so there's a there's a there's a sort of bunch of music in there that you'll draw from but I I don't go in and be like that's track one that's track two that's track three because I I, sometimes I always say with the best gigs the music starts picking itself which is quite weird but you're playing and yeah Wicked, bang, 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 and these are all going to work. And then it, it you know, is that because you know the music inside out as well? Yeah, but well, there's also a lot of times where I'm also playing. People may not necessarily think or believe that, that that happens to a lot of us DJs, but it does. You'll put stuff on that you've only really heard a few minutes of in your in your ears when you're going through your promos, or whatever. Obviously, you know you like it. It wouldn't be in my playlist if I didn't like it. But the amount the, the amount of music we're going through, there's obviously certain tracks. If, you, if you've got my my music out now and you're like, what's that one sound like on that one? Sometimes without clicking it, you you won't remember what it sounds like. So, you know, you are playing sometimes stuff for the first time and you are playing new music, which is what's exciting. So when you're having it, it's like that's because you're experiencing that with them, you know. You you obviously work with Pioneer for for a number of years. Yeah. Um, how do you like utilize technology? Do you think it's do you think it's it's made DJing better? Um, do you think it's 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 accentuated? You're much more of a performer performer now as opposed to a uh, you know a selector or a, a bit of both. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I I think um, all the technology stuff now is is great for getting anyone into the into the scene. The more DJs, the more people playing music, the better, and the the more the longevity it gives the whole the whole thing but certainly you know back in the day you it would be expensive to buy equipment you know it'd be expensive to buy whether even with production if you're buying simps or everything else it's cost loads of money the fact that now you can buy these like all-in-one units and you know for fairly cheap in in, in, in relation to a laptop or whatever else and get kids playing on that sort of stuff's great because making it more accessible for people to kind of enjoy mi- playing and mixing music or making music is a good thing you know trying to pushing prices up and making things ridiculously expensive or hard to get hold of only only sort of limits people's interest in it so yeah the tech that side of the technology thing's been been great i mean you can mix on ipads yeah and iphones now with apps and stuff so. do, do you do you spend a lot of time um, uh, in, in like record box the software preparing them you like cue pointing memory pointing do you spend a lot yeah. of time doing that i i um structure all my music in itunes and then i import those playlists from iTunes into Rekordbox so they sort of mirror fine um but i i use smart playlists a lot on on iTunes which is well i've only been doing it now for about 5 or 6 years but it's the fucking best invention ever you can obviously putting on the comments section of tracks if i've put i don't know bomb or closing or classic or whatever and i've made playlists with those names if as soon as you type that in on that track it puts it in that playlist for you, so it's all kind and of because you've set the rules to a, a digital filing system. Yeah, yeah. Enter any track with bomb in the comment section. Yeah. And you've got a whole folder Stick of absolutes. it in there. Yeah, oh, nice. Okay, so it's perfect, it, it, and especially when you're going through like the amount of music that you've got, it's an easy way. You know where stuff's gonna be. So a lot of my music, I'll, I'll once I've kind of put it into playlists, I'll comment on the tracks on the comment section, and whatever I've written, I've got smart playlists for those sort of things. You know, you've got a great story about um, so D- uh, Pioneer have come out with the new DGM. V10, uh, yeah. the, the beast or whatever they call it, which yeah, is you know massive. six channel mix, incredible kind of th- you know I think it was to compete with the Allen and Heath, yeah, uh, you know the the four four band EQ six channel um, yeah. was ninety two was it ninety zone ninety two yeah zone ninety two yeah um, the techno mix so everyone's yeah everyone loves because I've seen your videos you, you used to use that but now you've yeah. gone across to. Yeah, I mean, Alan and Heath will fucking hate me, won't they, really? But, I mean, I've been <laughs> using that Alan and Heath mixer for, for years and years and years and years. And Pioneer, I've always had a relationship with Pioneer. Anyway, I know the guys really well. They've you know, I've tested products for them for a long time, from production to CDJs, mixers and everything else. They call on me a lot for um, kind of 
survey type feedback and you know direct response on using stuff so i always had that relationship with them and for years there's always been a thing with pioneer where they've wanted to pull people off of that, that's a weird term <laughs> <laughs> they've always, sure they have yeah <laughs> fine they've always wanted to get people away from the allen and heath and get them onto a pioneer mix yeah and, you know now they've done it um and we've we've been a part of that you know um they told i remember the meeting it was we, we were told to go to dc 10 um before it was before no, mid, middle of the day or whatever i think it's me latman lauren lane jamie jones um a couple of other people that were selected and then pioneer have turned up and we were expecting to see this new mixer that everyone has been kind of um you know been so we had to do an, an, an nda so we knew something was coming but we were expecting to see a mixer and then this kind of like poster tube <laughs> comes out and then they sort of slide out this like unroll this kind of blueprint and what do you think to that? It's like, yeah, okay, cool. So let's sort of have a look at this 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 sketch, and then even from that stage, though, it was like you could you could see obviously it's it's to scale, so you knew how big the thing was going to be, but it was still very much open to negotiation on where things were going to go and, and everything else. And I always play with a when I when I was using the um, the Allen Heath, I always play with a DD7 delay pedal, um, and I and the four band EQ and all that sort of stuff that was already on there because they knew certain things to get the Allen Heath users onto it. You need to have this the built in effects with the short delay, long delay. So that so you was just... put in for me, fine, okay. yeah, and other and other people that they've got feedback from that use those pedals. You know, I know each uses those pedals, and lots of other people probably use them. But I like to think that certain things on the, those mixes they put for us because it got us away from having to use those pedals. Because yeah. you'll see, I've seen the mixer. You've got an effects, normal effects stuff here, but then you've got this other yeah. reverb and delay here which is basically to mirror and it, 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 the, the dd7 the boss dd7 pedal and kind of the filters and everything else from the allen and heath so there's there was no reason really why i wouldn't use the mixer Fine. um and yeah as i said i've still got i've still got a zone 92 i'll do the radio with that i've got a set up with that at home but i've also got the v10 which is my performance mixer that so i've got a zone on. 92 but i yeah. i i got it early on because everyone's and i i've only ever played with it a few times but if you've come from a background where you use effects and you yeah. do stuff it'll be a basic mixer you'll yeah. be like well i can filter and that's it yeah you know? but you know historically sort of if you're playing techno and stuff and you're mixing maybe three or four vinyl decks it's perfect because the blend of the eqs on an Allen heath is wicked yeah um and it is a great mixer it's just now now that i've we've incorporated all that into the v10 and i already use pioneer everything else it, it's brought it all together right. you know so I, I feel now like i'm connected to that mixer in some way You've actually got a song coming out um, on the We Are the Brave that your son's featured in, is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is quite mad. But again, that that's a, a, a pure lockdown moment. They're not at school. They're not doing anything creative. You know, they're kind of stressed out as well. They're not with their friends. Not doing stuff that they should be doing at their age, which kind of ignites them to you know sit on their iPads and do different things. He's playing on Garage Band and making these little loops and. You know, it's very hard to get my kids to even come in the studio when I'm sat working in there because they're just like that's you know, no relationship with it. That's just dad's workspace, you know. Um, they like the flashy lights and yeah, the press the keyboards and, and, and stuff. Yeah, yeah. But in terms of like what I'm actually doing, it didn't really happen. And obviously, they're younger. My kids are ten and six, so my six-year-old Barbie's not in there. She's not really <laughs> yeah, yeah. But he was he was kind of you know obviously not at school and being creative and playing with making loops on Garage Band and I. He played me one. It was saved as this sounds like my dad or whatever. So he played me this loop, and I was like, actually, that's that's quite cool. I reckon I could do something with that. And he was like, what really? So I obviously exported the the WAV off of the um, uh, Garage Band or whatever it was that he was using, put it into my all my production software, started messing around with the loop, got it sounding really really good. Had him playing on the um, drum machine, making stuff with me, and we we come up with the track, take control, um, and. It's quite a mental thing, really. I never thought I'd have him on a, on a on a release me, especially being ten. But he's completely stoked at the fact that he's going to be on Spotify and he's probably going to hear it on Radio One and all these sort of things. He's probably can't wait to get back to school and say to his mates, "Look, I'm, I've got I've had a track out do, in lockdown." Do you think what that's going to be a moment for him now where he's going to want to get in production? Now he's seen you do it. I think he's he's definitely paying more attention now to right. to, to the way things are made and stuff. But then he's still at the age where he'll he'll get me to load up a sound on the, on a synth and he'll just want to play the Rocky theme tune or something yeah, mental fine, like that, fine, you yeah. know. Something, but, but, but again, what it is doing is encouraging him to see how things are put together, um, and I think it'd be great for him when he kind of sees when the track's out and he's hearing it on the radio and stuff like that. that. It's just amazing. a proud moment for me because I, I want to. 
you always want to have your kids understand what it is you do and how you get to where you are so it's a great way of him seeing what i actually do and how maybe you know how it's put together and what's that called that that's going to be called? Take, take control, take control. And it's out on the 19th of this month right so when this out's the 19th of uh, of march that I'm, I'm going to see, i want to see that see yeah, that yeah. So you have to i'll have to message you and point out which was a part of the loop in it yeah well, that yeah, you came yeah. Out with. Um, yeah with the hook the main the main kind of pattern in the, in the hook oh really that, that come from him yeah, what a yeah. boy i love that that's, yeah. i can see like a proud dad moment as well I can feel it. Like I can feel it. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's cool. That I'm excited to get to play it out and then to show him the, the crowd, footage of it the doing. Yeah, because I haven't yeah. had that with my track there, <laughs> make you feel, which is out on the the six. It'll be out after this has come out. Most people will give DJs get to see the music played and they get to see the crowd reaction. I'm never going to have that. I never, you know, <laughs> I put it off as late as I could with uh, with the label Deeper Dance that, we, that I released on. But I'm not going to see that. But I, when hopefully if someone does play it, they do like it. I can't wait for that because <laughs> yeah. it'll be the first. It'll be like losing my virginity. I yeah, never would have done that. Yeah, Seeing yeah. someone play that and people putting their hands in the air if they do, I'll be like, yeah. and that'll be a whole different experience and emotion that you've not had yet. Yeah, oh well, yeah. I mean, I can't wait to play. There's, you know, having such a big output of music throughout lockdown and not hearing any of those in a venue is kind of mental so i'm do going to have to revisit all that music and make sure that not the, all, all of the producers that have done music over the last year that isn't forgotten and we don't just start from when we get back yeah, yeah. because there's so much good music that hasn't been played in nightclubs or festivals or whatever that we need to re-appreciate give it the due attention it deserves 100 percent. yeah um is there anyone you haven't collaborated with that you want to collaborate with in production someone you're desperate to work with um i've been quite lucky i um, worked with a lot of people I think um, musically, it's never really anyone from. I, I like to pull in like different influences from different genres. So, you know, working with someone like Grimes or something like that would be quite cool, or a, a really good vocalist. Um, but not not necessarily in 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 my sort of production or you know style of genre of music. I think more so I'd pull on someone completely weird that you wouldn't wouldn't think you could work with, like. Radiohead or Ben Howard or you know Tom York, obviously people like that, just because it's mad. And when you can, when you fuse different genres, you come up with some mad stuff. We've heard it here first. If Ben Howard and any of these people, yeah, are if you're listening, Tom, you know what I mean, give me a bell. <laughs> give it. And Ben, I know you've got a new album coming out, so you know why not? Let's get let's get stuck in. I love that. One thing I just want to touch before we, before we come to the to, to the end because I know we've been talking for a while, but it's fascinating. Like I feel like I talked to you for for, for ages. You might be bored at your fucking no, mind, but good, I, I'm happy. <laughs> is is talk to me about your mental health during this period because it's one thing we opened up with, and you've been really. Vocal vocal on your um on your instagram about your mood and yeah, about yeah. a roller coaster and i think i'm really i find it very important and empowering for people to be very open i'm perceived as like a, an alpha male in what yeah. i've done and yeah. for me to turn around and say i'm having a bad day it's okay to speak up is important and i think what you're doing is being great but it's been really tough for you hasn't it oh, 100 percent. yeah i mean obviously start of the podcast we mentioned it's hard to articulate into words straight away when you're yeah. sort of trying to think about how it's been but yeah certainly going going through different emotions and being stressed not knowing what's going on with your company your you know your, your career and how you're going to support your family and everything else but also you know the kind of I wanted to share that, that, that I'd had good days and bad days. And I, I, th I think us being public figures and having a following of people, it's important to let them know if, when you're feeling shit and yeah. when you're feeling good and not put up this kind of screen of, yeah, I'm all good, you know, everything's fine. I did get frustrated in the first part of... of, of sort I of, felt angry as well. Yeah, angry. very angry. Yeah. And I was also angry that more people weren't saying anything. It yeah. just started to really do my head in where I'm like... Why is everyone fine with this? Obviously, as you start to get more educated, you, you have to accept that there is a massive pandemic going on. There's loads yeah. of people losing their lives, and it's horrific. So you do go through lots of emotions. But I really wanted... Why why are people not kind of expressing how they feel more and almost just being saying nothing, you know? So I think I just... I got to a stage where I was like, I, I want people to know that it's OK to say you're having a shit day. I mean, I've, I've been... Um, you know, there's, there's, there's people that I know and I'm, I'm aware of and other friends, people that have been taking their lives during mm. this stuff. You know I mean, the, the, the next pandemic is everyone's mental health coming out of this. Yes. How are people going to be reacting in crowds? How If I if I walk, if you walk in and you see someone you haven't seen, Reggie, you give them a hug, do yeah. they freeze up and, you know... I'm of, a hugger, but this is our first time we met today. Oh, so right. I would have <laughs> gone straight in, but if you'd gone... Eh! 
Yeah. <laughs> I'd have been like, that's what okay. I can't. Maybe that's not the thing. Yeah, I refuse. Like the fist bump, I'm okay. The elbow touch, get fucked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hug, yeah. I, I'm a hunger. I'm tactile as well. Yeah, so fine. all of us, like, it's, we're, that's just what we like, yeah. you know. But to, to let people know that you're not feeling okay sometimes is, is, is important, and it was important to me. And also to express my frustrations. There was times where we'd see these government updates and there's just zero support for our sector in terms... I'm not talking about me. I'm always talking about other people. The, the glass collectors, the cloakroom staff, the, the bouncers, the doormen, the techs, all these people, just being forgotten, just no help at all, gave me so much anger and, like, what the fuck, you know? So I had to sort of express that to people and let people know that that's how you're feeling, you know? But I feel that you've actually, from watching what you've done and what we talked about, I remember we, we spoke about some stuff and asked you about coming on the podcast and other things... You actually said, obviously, you're spending a lot of time in the studio, so you've channeled yourself into that. You've channeled spending time with your family. And from what I can see, the regime and travelling, however great a dad you are, it's always going to put a strain on, on, on your family life, just not being there. Like, even if you're working, yeah. it's for hard. You must miss them. It makes everything kind of quite quite more difficult. But one thing you've got behind is actually trying to be much more vocal and fight for clubs and stuff. Do you want to tell people about what's been happening with that? Because the government have just bring shit about the entertainment industry. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we obviously it's an industry that brings billions, 7.5 billion into the into the industry into the, you know, uh, the whole economy, you know. Yeah. Um and the nighttime industries have been great about trying to get a voice and you know countless people Yusuf has been amazing, Fat Tony's been amazing, Simon Dunmore have been incredible like uniting people with all the kind of virtual festivals and the defected stuff giving people something to be excited about. Um, Michael Keel has been an absolute legend. Obviously, he's sort of fronting the nighttime industries and, you know, just raising awareness, getting on GM, getting on Good Morning Britain and getting on Sky News, getting on BBC as much as we can and telling people about, you know, this This is important. This is... Why Why is... Not, not just dance music, but, like, theatres and stand-up comedians and anything entertainment-wise... Why has that just completely been disregarded to a point and and it, it's and not been supported? You know, I'm telling you to reskill. Ah, oh, mate, <laughs> fuck. How, oh, I mean that that's another thing that just makes you want to sort of beat your head against the wall. When you when you when I saw that poster of that ballerina, yeah, can't remember the girl's name, but so and so may have a career in cyber, but she just doesn't know it yet. Yeah. Rethink, reskill, educate, or whatever. Yeah, it's like, yeah. fuck <laughs> you. And you can't say that. And yeah. what idiot put that together? What idiot yeah. thought that was okay to take someone's passion, being a ballerina or whatever, or just you know, an artist, yeah. if anything, and then to say, yeah, she should be an IT, really. I mean, it's just... It, like To talk about, like baiting someone yeah. when you, it just annoyed me all that sort of stuff and it's it's not cool I mean, I, I'm, sh I'm shocked by it because you know fundamentally um, in my view or not you know if you take away everything take away education people doing amazing stuff we're, we're essentially we live we, we, we're born we live we fuck we reproduce and we die so well, what kind yeah. of life is that without the beauty of art entertainment music theatre comedy literature before, whatever performance whatever thing is life of that is, is, is that and to be disregarded and not to have any fun Funding, uh, and on the expectation that there are other, you know, other priorities and stuff, it's like context is key. And what everyone always loses in, and, and, and what I did a video on my social media about it is that your experience of COVID is different than my experience of COVID. It's all a personal thing. Yeah, your different your experience of life is different to mine. So for some people, they've lost loved ones, lost everything. They have now symptoms, continual symptoms of COVID. For some people, they got it, they didn't even notice it. For some people, it's made fuck all difference to them. Yeah. Right? yeah. But nobody ever counters anyone's opinion because they think you have to think like me. And if you don't... You're we, wrong, yeah. Yeah, and we, we used to be wrong in pubs or in person. <laughs> now we just tell each other on social media. Now we tell everyone we're, 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 we're wrong. And I, I'm astounded that that this has kind of happened. And I, and I think it's amazing what you're doing. If people want to find out more information about that, where can they go? How can they support if they want to? Even just give yeah, a so um, there's some there's some great companies. So that we, we make events and the, uh, let the music play, let us dance campaign and go go on and, and check out the Nighttime Industries website. You know, people like Sasha Lord and, and, and Michael Kill and people that have been doing a great, uh, thing for us in terms of speaking up um, but yeah check out uh, all of those are hashtags as well um, and you'll find all the information about that sort of stuff and we just keep sort of fighting the good fight sort of thing to, to bring it to everyone's attention really uh, and hopefully like we said that the clubbing scene and the scene will come back to what it what it was yeah exactly because I think we'll be because everyone's desperate to have a rave 
Well, and exactly going back to what you were saying a minute ago about sort of you know without those things in life, what's you know what's the sort of point? There's a lot, of, you know, just basic things you, you you do, but the entertainment side of it has been an intrinsic part of human life. I, I, I imagine it in during the cavemen times there would have been some idiot jumping around with sticks trying to make everyone laugh. Yeah, of course there would have been. He would have been a comedian, and there'd be someone else banging on a drum to make people dance, and probably some other mate banging his missus in yeah. front of him because yeah, it yeah. was cavemen. But that sort of stuff is still now happening now. But, you know, it's all part of our culture, yeah. so you you can't disregard that. No, but also what people forget as well is that some the average, sometimes the average punt in the street. So, you know, low uh, socioeconomic issues, low income, not maybe not the brightest, whatever. Live nine to five, they grind just to put money on the table, and their escapism is to save up money to go and watch Alan Fitzpatrick rave up on a Friday night. Yeah. Is to go to the cinema or go to watch something uh, and the film industry, all these things that have been closed down and stopped. That's how people get through life. Yeah. The people who have, you know, who have maybe the worst thing, they're looking after an elderly relative or, or a family member. Maybe their one escapism is listening to some absolute bangers and, and going away for a weekend to do something if they get the they get the chance. Yeah. But that's all been disregarded. The point is that it's it's surplus to requirements. Without this stuff, everyone's mental health is even more fucked yeah, because exactly. of it. Because yeah, they yeah. don't get to have, they don't get to express it, and then they just get the actual reality of life, which is, wake up, I go to work, I try to save, some fucker takes the money off, or I get taxed off, and then I go to bed and I go round again. Yeah, exactly. I mean, and you need you need that escapism. You need you need to give people that that, that that sort of thing. You know, people do need to kind of let loose, and that's what our culture kind of provides that sort of stuff. As you say, whether it's going to the cinema, or seeing a comedian, watching a band, or you know, going to a theatre or whatever those are the things in life that you look forward to doing so you know i am interested in just asking you but where before we before we end because at the end i've got two questions to ask you is um do you like virtual sets do you like virtual djing i um i don't mind it i, I mean i think what the one thing that is the bonus to that sort of stuff is the reach i mean you know how many times can you be playing in a club um, in uh, one city, which only the people in that room are experiencing that? Yes, it might be recorded. You could kind of do it as a radio show or whatever. But being able to sort of tune in the world when you're playing is, is a pretty cool thing. Someone asked me the other week, do I, do I think the virtual stuff will stay when, when, when the sort of clubs come back? Or will everyone just bin that off and go back to what they're doing? I think to a degree, especially, like, you know, Defective have done it amazing. I, I mean, thought they were brilliant. Production-wise yeah. and everything, it looks great. And if you're, if you're at home and, you, and you've got a big projector or whatever, and you could make, really make an atmosphere of that, do you know what I mean? They've done it really well. So I do think, to a degree, some of that virtual stuff should or will stay because it connects people. And maybe they'll, maybe they'll put virtually stream actual gigs with crowds as well for people who couldn't make it. Yeah, exactly. It could, yeah. you know, could be an option, definitely. I think just bringing... What, what's going to be key coming out of this is the the feeling of bringing humans to, to, together again and back to being normal, not this, like, crossing the road when someone's fucking walking past you and all that. You know, Obviously, there's a degree of... You've got to do that at the moment, but yeah. we, when that's gone... You need to get that out of people's heads to be, you're all right now. Yeah. You can act normal, be normal, and go back to the life you knew before all this yeah. happened. Listen, Alan, thank you so much. I've really enjoyed that. I know we've talked for for, for ages, but um, you're an amazing bloke. I think it's an, uh, what you're doing is fantastic. Obviously, raising awareness. Um, and as I said, people, please listen to his music. Please follow. And I'm, I will buy the tickets. But as soon as you get the first booked an event, I'm going to come in and see it. Like see it. Yeah, live. you should. Yeah, man, it'd be good to good to kind of at least see it in first hand. You know, experience it. I'd love if to we... do that. Well, listen, guys, thank you so much for listening. That was what a flank of the podcast. If you like it, please share. Please subscribe. We're obviously a YouTube show as well. You can pick this podcast up on any of your regular podcasting uh, platforms. Stay tuned because there's plenty more interviews coming. 